Well, it's an extraordinary joy and privilege to be uh, here with you today. Uh, as your rector has been telling you uh, for the last couple of weeks, I gather, uh, we've known each other now for well over a decade uh, through our time in Virginia Seminary. And when I first came there, and Katie was very helpful in helping to settle me in there. And uh, Matthew has the very important job of taking me out once a week and beating me at golf. Um, it's slightly weird being in St. Martin in the Fields, or at least St. Martin in the Field. Uh, I'm used to the one in Trafalgar Square, which apparently has lots of fields. Um, and when I was in, working in South Africa, I also visited and preached in St. Martin in the Veldt. Um, and St. Martin, of course, was a soldier who is immortalized for giving his cloak to a beggar. And the ministry of St. Martin's in Trafalgar Square is very much one among the homeless uh, that uh, often sleep in the doorways between Trafalgar Square and King's College London, where I'm Nadine, just up the road. So, but to be here in America and to find that I've been given the most famous verse in the Bible to preach on. <laughs> John 3.16. I mean, you even have it emblazoned on t-shirts. Uh, I don't know whether you have this habit uh, here. In, in English, particularly in sort of southern estuary English, you use the word John for, you know, a, a guy or a dude or something. So, know what I mean, John, is a, is a common sort of experience. And so you get these wonderful t-shirts that have 316 on the front and on the back it simply says, know what I mean, John. Uh, and every time I stay in a wonderful American... Uh, hotel when I come over for the big conferences there's always a nice oak cabinet in the corner and I think oh good gin and tonic <laughs> when sadly it's most often a television and there are hundreds of stations and every other one is a TV evangelist hitting the screen of the big bible saying you must be born again John 3.16 so what does it mean and are those TV evangelists right after all and my goodness me, what has it got to do with that bizarre Old Testament story, beautifully illustrated by William Blake and on the front cover of this week's uh, service sheet? So I'm going to give you a bit of a Bible study, really. Um, and I was saying to Matthew the other day, one of the most interesting things I find about, as a biblical scholar about John 3.16 is who says it. It does actually say in your service sheet and in the book, the gospel book I just read, Jesus said, open quote. Actually, that bit's not in the Bible. It's very odd that actually the most famous verse in scripture, and it's not clear who says it. So I want to just back up a bit into uh, trying to do the whole of John 3 in uh, 10 minutes without a safety net. So do buckle up your safety belts. Um, I'm trying to live up to Matthew's build-up about this rock star or whatever it was he's been telling you. Um, over the next few chapters of John's Gospel, lots of people come to Jesus. There's the Samaritan woman, the official whose son is healed. There's a paralytic who can't get into the waters. There's a crowd who want to be fed. There's a blind man. They're all coming to Jesus. But the first one is this extraordinary chap called Nicodemus. He's a Pharisee, he's a ruler of the Jews, he's a member of the Sanhedrin, which is like the Jewish council. He's a man of influence and wealth, and later in the gospel he will spend a huge amount of money on spices for, to anoint Jesus' body. And Jesus recognizes this and pays him respect. He calls him a teacher of Israel, uh, a theologian perhaps. In other words, he's the winner of a Ratzinger Prize from the Pope. <laughs> But he comes to Jesus by night. Now that may be a mark of caution, because he is one of the authorities to be seen a, a converting with, a, with such an odd person such as Jesus. But it is also true that in the rabbinic tradition, night is the time for the study of the scriptures, when it's nice and quiet. And that's when most of my books get written. But, so whether it's out of fear, or because he wants to talk to Jesus undisturbed, Nicodemus is in the dark, and he comes to the light. 
And in due course, he will actually have to come out of the darkness and stand up for Jesus in the discussions with the authorities. But at the moment, he's staying in the dark, coming out of the shadows and asking questions. And last week, when we were looking at John chapter 2, and I'm sure your rector explained this, you saw the habit that John has of misunderstanding and working at various levels. Do you remember uh, Jesus said he would destroy the temple in three days and raise it again? And all the Jews said, you cannot be serious. It's taken us 46 years to get to this point already. And John says, yes, but he was actually talking about a deeper level down below about his body. The same thing happens here. Jesus doesn't ever actually answer any of Nicodemus's questions. This is the problem with Jesus. He just wants to tell us what he'd like us to know. Um, and he tells Nicodemus, you must be born over again. That great text that I say, you must be born again, that I always hear when I'm here. Um, the Greek word there is anothen. Um, and Nicodemus um, says, well, hang on, how do I get born again? And he comes up with this image of, can a man crawl back up the birth canal into his mother's womb um, and as uh, Matthew has said I've, I've done a bit of work with the Monty Pythons and I can just imagine a Terry Gilliam cartoon of a theologian trying to crawl back up into his mother's womb actually the word anothen if you look some of the Bible translations will say born again and some will say born from above and the word actually has both meanings you know the way in which you use the phrase start over or to, let's take it from the top meaning you know, we, we start again and it's another one of these wonderful word plays is Jesus starting talking about being born again or is he talking about being born from above i.e. Uh, from, from God and both Jews and Greeks were familiar with this idea of a new birth, a new life uh, and so Nicodemus is misunderstanding, coming up with a really Pythonesque idea of crawling into his mother's womb, allows Jesus to turn around and say, no, you have to be born of, well, what our translations say, water and the spirit. Actually, water and the breath is a much better translation, because the word there is pneuma, gives you pneumonia and pneumatic tire and so on. There's a lot of water around in this gospel. Jesus baptizes in it, in chapter 1, he turns it into about 150 gallons of fine wine for one hell of a party in chapter 2. Uh, he offers it to a woman, who, though he hasn't got a bucket, in chapter 4. He, he heals a guy by a pool when the angel comes and stirs it all up in chapter 5. He walks on it in chapter 6. He offers it to the thirsty in chapter 7. And he sends the blind man to wash his face in it in chapter 9. And in chapter 13 he turns up with a big bowl of it and washes his disciples' feet. So John and Jesus have clearly got this thing about water and there's something cleansing and healing and satisfying about water. And so it's little wonder then that most people translate the phrase be born of water and the spirit as referring to Christian baptism which, or I like to use as much water as I can when I'm doing baptism or uh, and the spirit to be back to confirmation. But once again we're getting this habit of the literal wooden um, understanding getting back into the womb with spiritual rebirth when uh, my daughters were born and their mother's waters broke I remember being amazed just how much water there was all over the kitchen floor and the first thing that happened after a long and difficult birth was you wait for them to take their first breath and usually what they do with it is to shout at you and to howl and say, what on earth's going on? Why am I out here? It was much nicer back where I was earlier. <laughs> water and breath are crucial. And if the waters do not break, the baby cannot be born. And if the baby doesn't breathe, it cannot live. And so, Jesus is actually being pretty concrete with, you know, okay, Nicodemus, you want to get back into your mother's womb? Well, there's going to be a lot of water, and you're going to need to learn to breathe. But yes, of course, he's also playing with another level of meaning, of water, eking baptism. To be born of the flesh is flesh, says Jesus. But to be born of the breath is to be like the wind. The wind which comes and goes invisibly. And that's why this word pneuma means both breath and spirit. You've got to fill your lungs 
with the Holy Spirit of God. And what Jesus is doing is challenging Nicodemus to come out of the darkness, to stop hiding in the shadows, to take a big step, to be born again, to get washed, take a big breath, and start to be carried on the winds of the Spirit. On the other hand, poor old Nicodemus is still struggling with his theology exam and has to ask for some further explanation. And Jesus sort of, by this stage, has kind of got into the kind of John Cleese teacher mode and bangs his head on the desk and says, you're a teacher of Israel and you don't understand these kind of things. You better give that prize back to the Pope. Uh, You should know all the old prophecies about God giving his people a new heart and a new spirit, about bringing dry bones back to life and all of that. Truly, truly, I say to you, says Jesus, and starts to talk at Nicodemus in verse 11. And then something happens, which is really rather strange. Nicodemus disappears. He's not mentioned again throughout the rest of the chapter until he reappears at the council several chapters later to come out of the darkness and stand up for Jesus. And whereas Jesus has been using you singular pronouns, thou in the old English, he switches now to talk about we and you plurals. And he starts speaking in verse 11, and it's not at all clear when he stops speaking. Does he stop speaking at the end of verse 15, or at the end of verse 16, or the end of verse 321, and so on. And it's as though this quiet nighttime conversation between Jesus and an individual Nicodemus has now moved into Jesus speaking through the evangelist and the early Christians to all the Jews, and indeed to all the human race, to receive our testimony. And therefore, the Old Testament allusions move away from prophets and uh, and Jacob's ladder and all the other stuff to Moses and the Israelites in the wilderness, that extraordinary story in Numbers, of the Israelites grumbling against Moses and God. And we had it also in this morning's psalm, uh, where it talked about... um, them being foolish and taking a rebellious way and abhorring the food and they get punished by being bitten by poisonous snakes and the remedy God gives Moses and it's beautifully illustrated if slightly weirdly by William Blake's painting um, is that Moses should make a bronze snake and lift it up on a pole and anybody who looks at it was healed the bronze serpent uh, remained in the temple for centuries but it was eventually smashed by Hezekiah. Uh, read two kings and you'll see it's all in there. Um, but it continues to be an enormous symbol of healing and salvation, even through all the intertestamental wisdom literature. But John, at the same time, is going back to his usual habit of layers of meaning. The word simply, hupsul, is to lift up. And that just means, you know, hold the serpent up. But if you look at Blake's picture, just, just turn to the front of the uh, picture for the service sheet. What has Moses, or rather, how has Blake depicted what Moses has put the bronze serpent on? It's a cross. And you see how the snake is wound around the cross. And later, throughout John's Gospel, Jesus says, when the Son of Man is lifted up, It means when the Son of Man is exalted, when I'm raised up. And yet, of course, we know that actually it's also used of him being put on the cross, being raised up on a cross. And so there's this mixture of levels going on. Look beyond the earthly things, says Jesus. Look to the spiritual things. See in a broken man, lifted up on an instrument of torture and death, our means of healing and the source of eternal life. And we have a stained glass window in the chapel at uh, our medical campus at King's, uh, the Guy's Chapel, which depicts, again, a very similar picture of the cross with a snake on it. And, of course, that's become a symbol of healing throughout the centuries. And so that gives us the context for this extraordinary verse, John 3.16. Whether it's the end of Jesus' conversation with Nicodemus or a comment by the evangelist is not really terribly important because it's one of the supreme passages of this gospel, full of John's favourite vocabulary and themes, rich in the love of God and set within this whole series of contrasts that we've been having, light and darkness, truth 
and falsehood, death and life. And it's so God loved the world. Often people think that John uh, uh, and the Bible are negative about the world. And it is true that later in the Gospel, when Jesus is talking in the uh, Last Supper discourses, uh, that the world is opposed to him. But here it's absolutely clear. God so loved the world. And the Greek word there is cosmos. Not just the world. God loved the cosmos. The whole universe. For all its sin, for all its shortcomings, the cosmos, the created order, is the object of God's love. And sometimes I have to say that Christians read John 3.16 like God so loved the church that he gave. Or even go back to these, uh, the TV evangelists I was talking about. It's all about God loved you and you make your individual decision. That is important. But this verse reminds us that God loved the world so much that he sent his only son. And the word there in the traditional language translates the Greek more fully. God loved his only begotten son, monogenes. And that reminds his readers of another Old Testament story. That Abraham is told to take his only son, the son he's been waiting for for years, and go up a mountain, be lifted up with his only son, and pick up some wood, and his son to be offered as a sacrifice. In the end, of course, Abraham is told to spare his son. But God's son also is lifted up on a piece of wood and is not spared. That is the price of the divine love. I asked God how much he loved me. And he opened wide his arms and said, this much, and died. And that idea of God sending Jesus occurs at least 50 times in God's gospel. And it's clear he's doing it to save the world. Um, I confess I I struggle with the translation we had just now that talked about uh, being condemned and so on. The word there is crinane. It it, it gives us our word critique, critic, crisis. And and so if I could read it again, trying to keep the same word all the way. God did not send the Son into the world to criticize the world. And those who believe in him are not criticized. And those who do not believe are criticized already. And this is the criticism. This is the crisis. That the light has come into the world. And people preferred darkness rather than light. We have a choice every day throughout our whole life. Do we want to be like Nicodemus? stay in the shadows or are we also going to be like Nicodemus and turn to the light when you turn to the light shadows fall behind you so Jesus comes not to condemn not to criticize not to judge but to bring truth and light and life and later in the gospel Nicodemus will make a choice and will come out into the open and stand up for Jesus and help to bury him. And Judas will go out and it will be dark and it will be night. And throughout the whole of the gospel is this story of light and darkness, death and life. God sent his son into the world that we should not perish but have eternal life. Amen. Amen.